Well, we come to question seven in the Baptist Catechism, and the question is this. What do the Scriptures principally teach? And another way you could say that is, what is the main point of the Scriptures? Or what do the Scriptures mainly or chiefly teach? What are they communicating to us? Or another way, what is God revealing to us chiefly in His Word? There are a lot of different genres in the Scriptures. There's poetry, there's history, there are letters, there are prayers. But what is the main point of it all? And the answer given in question 7 of the Baptist Catechism is this. The Scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. The Scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. Now, do you remember question four in the Baptist Catechism? It is, what is the Word of God? And the answer is, the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments being given by divine inspiration are the Word of God. The only infallible rule of faith and practice means the only inerrant, without error, pure word, rule of what we should believe, that's what faith means, and practice, what we should do. And so now, this answer to what do the Scriptures principally teach is essentially saying the Scriptures principally teach what we should believe and what we should do. The Scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God, and by implication, what we should believe concerning ourselves in light of who God is, and then what duty God requires of man. Now up front, I need to be clear. In question seven that we're dealing with right now, we're not going to get in depth into answering what is God, or what in particular the Scripture actually teaches about God. That, that will come later, and that's actually question eight in the Baptist Catechism. What is God? And in that question, Lord willing, next week we will dig into the attributes of God, the essence of God, who He is, and what He's like. And so it will, as most of these questions have gone, they, they piggyback off of one another. And so question six was, may all, yet, may all men make use of the Scriptures? The answer is yes. We're not only permitted to, but we're commanded and exhorted to read, study, hear, and obey what God says in the Scriptures, to understand what God says. And so question seven isn't dealing with who God is as much as the fact that the Scriptures teach us what we should believe concerning God. So please don't wonder why we are not digging deep into what we should particularly believe about God as laid out in the Scriptures. That's that's not our aim tonight. My aim is to show why the answer to question seven is what it is, that the Scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires Of man. And so we're going to take this under two headings, and we'll have quite a bit of scripture. And if you're if you're able to watch or listen, you need to know that I've put all of these scripture quotations below. So you would be able to follow along without flipping around frantically in your own copy of the Word of God. So they are there for your benefit. Take advantage of those if you would. The first heading that we will look at is that the Scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God. And I want to give you this brief little survey, these little blips all throughout the Scriptures and just show you that the evidence of all of the Scripture is that God is communicating to us in His Word what we should believe concerning Him. So if you think of the very first verse in our Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning, God created the heavens 
and the earth. So right off the bat, in Moses writing the book of Genesis, God is working through him to very clearly communicate to us who God is and what God is like. He is the creator and sustainer of everyone and everything. This is what we should believe about God, and the Scriptures are laboring to show us that. God is laboring to show us what we are to believe concerning Him. If you go to the book of Exodus, chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, when Moses asks to see Yahweh's glory, the Lord God's glory, we read this. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. When Moses wants to see the Lord's glory, the Lord shows it to him. And as he shows him his glory, he does it in such a way to proclaim who he is and what Moses and we reading it should believe concerning God. He doesn't only want us to see him in his glory. He wants us to concretely know who he is and what we should believe concerning him. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, the writer says, Long ago, at many times and in many or various ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He's speaking of the Lord Jesus. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high the very beginning of the book of Hebrews, all throughout redemptive history, God is screaming to us through the pages of Scripture what we should believe concerning Him. And we see clearly at the beginning of Hebrews that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. If you want to see truly and clearly the clearest example, explanation of who God is and what we should believe concerning Him, look at the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And God has spoke to us finally in Him. If you go to the very end of our Bible, in Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, the Apostle John is given the revelation of Jesus Christ And he's supposed to write it down so that Christians after that time would benefit and know what is going to happen and especially how God wins and what will happen after the Lord brings down the new Jerusalem, this new holy city, and renews the earth. And God then makes his dwelling place with us. And in Revelation 22, starting with verse 1, John records, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb. The Lamb is the Lord Jesus Christ who was slain in our place to make satisfaction for our sins so we can be forgiven. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, 
and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light or lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. As one author said, the man who comes to a right belief about God is relieved of 10,000 temporal problems. The man who comes to a right belief, a right understanding concerning God relieves himself of 10,000 temporary or temporal problems. The scriptures principally teach what man, what we are to believe concerning God. And so I would say to you, would you relieve yourself of 10,000 temporary problems? Do you want that? Then labor to get a right belief concerning God. That is the main point of what God is revealing to us in His Word. That is what the Scriptures principally teach. Then the second half of the answer, what do the Scriptures principally teach? Well, they principally teach what duty God requires of man, what God requires of us. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, towards the end of Moses' long sermon, right before he dies, he says, the secret things belong to Yahweh, our God, to the Lord, our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. This is an important verse for you and I to memorize and always bear in mind. What Moses is saying, there are secret things that belong to the Lord, that the Lord keeps within his own counsel. He does not reveal to us in the pages of Scripture or in redemptive history everything we want to know. He doesn't reveal to us everything there is to know, but he reveals to us what we need to know in order to be saved by faith through Jesus Christ and in order to know what God requires of us, how we are to glorify Him. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, That so that we may do all the words of this law. God has revealed to you Everything you need to know in order to trust in his son and obey his son in joy. God has revealed to us everything we know to fulfill our duty to God. And now I want to ask and then point you to eight things, eight duties that God requires of us. So what duties does God require of man? The Catechism says that, and and the reason we're going deeper into this is because the next question in our Catechism as we move through it, it doesn't go deeply into what duties God requires of man. It does go deeply into what we should believe concerning God. So that's why we're not going deeper into the first part of the question tonight, because Lord willing, when we get to question eight, we will go deeper into that. And so... Rather than us just passing over, oh yes, it reveals what duties God requires of us, let's look specifically kind of at a big flyover, in a big flyover way, what duties God requires of us. I'm going to mention eight. There are hundreds, there are maybe thousands of duties that are explicitly commanded in the Scripture or implied in the Scripture, but I want to give you these eight overarching duties that God requires of you. And I would recommend to you to go deeper into the duties that God requires of us. Just pour over the scriptures, read the scriptures and see what God commands of us, what God expects of us. And also in addition to that, a a further help would be to pick up John Piper's book called 50 Things 
Jesus demands from the world. That is a wonderfully beneficial book. What Jesus Demands from the World. That's the title. What Jesus Demands from the World. It has 50 short chapters, and he only goes to the gospel accounts to see what the Lord Jesus requires of us, what he commands of us. That's a wonderfully helpful book. You want to know how do I best glorify God? Well, Piper has laid out 50 things that the Lord Jesus requires of us and shows us this is how we glorify the Lord. But we're going to look at eight tonight. The first duty I would point you to is, it is your duty to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. In Mark 12, 29 and 30, and the Lord Jesus says this, talking about the commandments, he says, the most important is, hear, O Israel, and he's, he's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. It is your duty to love the Lord, to cherish the Lord who created you with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Second, it is your duty to love your neighbor as yourself. The very next verse in Mark chapter 12, verse 31 says, Jesus says, the second is this, the second greatest commandment is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The duty God requires of you is love God and love your neighbor as yourself. The word neighbor means anyone you're near, anyone you come in contact with, anyone outside of you. Everyone would qualify as your neighbor. Elsewhere, Jesus says, Upon these depend all of the law and the prophets. He's saying you can sum up the entirety of the commands of God in the scriptures if you get these two right. Love God with everything. Love your neighbor as yourself. Seek your neighbor's good as much as you seek your own good. Have you done that? Have you loved the Lord your God? with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? Have you worshiped him as you should? Have you been as grateful as you should be? Have you only ever looked to him for satisfaction, for provision, for health? Have you loved your neighbor as yourself? With all of the energy you exert to take care of your own self and feed yourself and pay your bills, have you, with that exerting energy, loved your neighbor? This is what God requires of you. And I can say with absolute certainty, you have not done that. And neither have I. And yet, this is what God requires of us. I know that you haven't done that, and I haven't done that, because God makes it clear in His Word. There is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 22 and 23. Do you see the roots of sin? It's not just disobeying the commands of God, but in Romans 3, 23, Paul makes clear, for all have sinned, there's no distinction. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you've come from. All have rebelled against God. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. God doesn't simply require us to love Him, and it's just external motions we go through loving God or loving our neighbor, but it's internal motives as well, such that everything we do would be seeking to glorify God, our Creator, our provider, our sustainer. 
Sin is not seeking the Lord's glory in everything. Not loving the Lord with everything and loving your neighbor as yourself. Our problem, friends, is that the two main duties that God communicates to us in His Word, we have failed at miserably. Our problem is that there is no small sin because there is no small God to sin against. There is only the infinitely Holy One who created us, who upholds us, who gives us all gifts of life. He has clearly revealed in our conscience and in the Bible what He requires of us. Yet we have all gladly rebelled against Him. And what we've earned through our not even upholding those two commandments, just those two, what we have earned through our rebellion is sin and death. The wages of sin, what God owes you, your paycheck is coming for your wages, and the paycheck reads death. For the wages of sin is death. We have preferred our own way to His. We've preferred our kingship to His, our rules to His, our path to His, our glory to His. Will what is made say to its maker, You have no right to tell me what to do? Not with impunity. Sin is, as R.C. Sproul wonderfully put it, sin is cosmic treason. And the wages of sin is death. Oh, not death and then obliteration and death and we... Our soul goes to sleep and we don't exist any longer, but death now and death forever in hell, paying what we have earned for our cosmic treason against our loving, gracious, and merciful Creator, who has given us everything we need to love Him and love our neighbor. Galatians 3, 10 and 13, Paul writes, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. If you rely on your own works, if you rely on your ability to love God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself, if you rely on your works, you are under a curse. As it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. See, God doesn't grade on a curve. God doesn't compare you to your evil neighbor who maybe does more evil deeds than you and say, well, Brett is better than his neighbor, therefore I'll be merciful to him. God doesn't grade on a curve. He doesn't say, you did pretty good at upholding these laws. No, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all that is written in the book of the law and do them. If we have failed in one command, one duty, we've failed in them all, and we are under a curse if we continue to rely on our works in order to make us acceptable to God and think that through our maybe good intentions or our ability to turn over a new leaf, that God would smile at us and we would be acceptable to Him. If you rely on anything or anyone outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, to make you acceptable to God, you are under a curse. Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. But here's the gospel. Here's the good news of what Jesus has done, what the Father sent the Son to do in order to redeem sinners as we are. Verse 13 in Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us, bought us back from the curse of the law. How? By becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed be everyone who is hanged on a tree. In the Old Testament law, it was a sign that a person was cursed if they were nailed, their body was nailed to a tree. 
And so God in his providence, that's in his law, and then the Lord Jesus comes and in our place is nailed to a tree and he takes the curse of God that we have earned through our sin in order to buy us back from that curse. The only way you're not going to be cursed by God is if you trust in the satisfaction Jesus made to his Father by becoming a curse for us. By being hanged on a tree and taking the wrath of God that we deserve. This is the good news of the gospel. And you don't get good news without first understanding the bad news. We have to understand the bad news is that we have not obeyed as we should. The third duty that the Lord requires of us is this. As a sinner who is in the path of the wrath of God, it is your duty to repent That means turn from your sin to repent and believe the gospel. That is your duty. That's what God requires of you. He doesn't sit and look at you in your sin and you're being owed a curse and death because you haven't done the simplest of his commands. He doesn't look and say, well, there's nothing left to require. No, he requires that you being in the path of his wrath before you die, today even, today is the day of salvation, it is your duty to repent and believe, trust in the gospel and what the Lord Jesus has done in becoming a curse for us. The reason I say that it is our duty is because in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, when the Lord Jesus comes onto the scene, when he comes to the earth, then he's about 30 years old and he begins his public ministry, these are the very first words that Mark records Jesus saying. Mark writes, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel is not a suggestion. The gospel is the good news of what Christ has done and will do for sinners to buy them back from the curse and bring them in to his loving embrace. And the message is, hear the gospel, and your duty is to repent and believe the gospel. And all who believe on Christ will never be put to shame. Never be disappointed. Your sins can be forgiven. But it is your duty. You must repent and believe on Christ. In John chapter 6, 28 and 29, they said to him, they said to the Lord Jesus, what must we do to be doing the works of God? The question is what most people ask when they realize that they don't have a good standing with God because of their sin. Well, what must I do to make sure that I'm doing the works of God? And then maybe God will be happy with me if I start doing my duty. And listen to the way the Lord Jesus replies to that question. What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, John 6, 29, this is the work of God that you believe, trust in, depend upon, put your confidence in him whom he has sent. And he's speaking of himself. To be doing the works of God, the first duty for a sinner to do is repent and believe in him, in Jesus, whom God has sent. As a sinner who's in the path of the wrath of God, it is your duty to repent and believe the gospel. The gospel is the good news that says what God requires, he provides in Jesus. Whom he provides for by Christ, he purifies by the Holy Spirit. Whom he purifies by the Spirit, he perfects or protects by his providence. And whom he protects by his providence, he will one day perfect in his presence. 
The gospel is the good news that says what God requires, he provides in in Christ Jesus. Whom he provides for in Christ, he purifies by the Holy Spirit. Whom he purifies by the Spirit, he protects by his providence. And whom he protects by his providence, he will one day perfect in his presence. The gospel is good news from beginning to end, from A to Z, from Alpha to Omega. It is the good news of what Jesus has done, what he'll keep doing, and what he's promised to do in the end. What God requires of you in your failure and sin, he provides graciously in the Lord Jesus. Go to him in faith and know that what God requires of you is provided for you only if you're in Christ by faith. This is your duty. This is my duty to be in Christ, to trust in him. Fourth, in Christ, once God saves you and you belong to Jesus, your faith is in him, in Christ, your duty is to take up your cross and follow Jesus. That means imitate Jesus. Obey Jesus. Everything that he's commanded in his word, it is your aim, it is your duty to follow him. And Jesus says, it looks like taking up an instrument of torture, putting your sin to death, putting your ambitions to death, and saying, Jesus, what would you have me think? What would you have me do? Mark 8, 34 through 38. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, Jesus said to them, If anyone would come after me, he means if anyone would follow me, if anyone would be my disciple, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Friends, in Christ it is your duty to take up your cross and follow the Lord Jesus. And if your faith is in Jesus, if you see that your only hope to have the curse lifted off of you for your law breaking is Jesus keeping the law perfectly for you and then going to the cross to become a curse for you, arising from the dead then to be your savior, then ascending to the right hand of God the Father to be your representative before God, if you see the truth of the gospel, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, You will look at commands like, take up your cross and follow me, and you will say, gladly. If you hear the command of Jesus, take up your cross and follow me. If anyone would come after me, he must do that. If you see that, hear that, and say, I don't want that, then you don't see Jesus for who he actually is. You don't see him as the infinitely glorious one who was once crucified for us, now resurrected as our Savior. You don't see him as the king of the universe of infinite value, the one who in his presence there is fullness of joy. Obedience to him is greater than obedience to yourself or the flesh or the devil or the world. You don't see him for who he is if you don't want to follow him. In Christ, it is your duty to take up your cross and follow Jesus. Those who have truly been converted can sing the old hymn, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound by sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. If you're in Christ, you can sing that with Wesley. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound by sin and nature's night, but thine eye diffused a quickening ray. 
I woke. The dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. And I rose, went forth, and followed thee. This is the song of all believers. Because it is our duty, and it is our joyful and glad duty, that we would take up our cross and follow Jesus. Fifth, in Christ... It is your duty to make disciples of all nations. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe, to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It is your duty, it is my duty, to go and make disciples of all nations. You go into your house, you go into your work, you go into your city, you go into any place that you frequent, anyone you can talk to, and it is your duty to make disciples. If you don't go to the foreign mission field, you better be sending foreign missionaries by your prayers and whatever money you have that God has given you that you can send to the nations. It is your duty. It is my duty to make disciples of all nations because the Lord Jesus commands it. He's got all authority. He says, go make disciples of all nations. And we who are in Christ, all of us say, gladly. Six, in Christ, it is your duty to act and speak in order to glorify God in all of life. In Christ, it is your duty to act and speak in order to glorify God in all of life, in order to show the worth and value of God in everything. 1 Corinthians 10.31, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. In Christ, it is your duty to act and speak in order to glorify God in all of life. Not on Sundays alone, not on Wednesdays, not when you're in your Bible studies, not only when you read your Bible or when you're conversing with someone who knows you're a Christian. It is your and my duty in all of life, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And the Christian says, I will gladly make that my aim. Seven, in Christ, it is your duty to worship God in all of life, especially as members of a local church. It is your duty to worship, to ascribe praise and honor and glory, ascribing glory to the Lord every day of your life, and especially as a member of the local church and in the corporate gatherings of the church to worship the Lord Jesus. That's your duty. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Not neglecting to meet together. The writer's talking about the regular, the regular, corporate gatherings of the people of Jesus that are expressed in what we call local churches. We come together to worship the Lord and stir one another up to love and good works. If you're not a vibrant, committed part of a local body of believers that has qualified pastors, that preaches the truth of the Word of God, that strives to be as close to the Bible as possible, if you're not a regular cooperating member of a local body, you are unfaithful. It is your duty not to neglect, 
the constant meeting together so that we may worship the Lord and stir one another up to love and good works, to encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. In Christ, it is your duty to worship God in all of life, especially as a member of a local church. And Christians, those who have truly been converted, say, gladly. Those who are Christians only in name, they profess it, but they don't possess faith. They haven't been born again. They don't say gladly a lot of times. They look at any excuse they can get in order to not meet together, to not worship the Lord with his people, to not stir one another up to love and good works. But the believer who has been born again says gladly. I wouldn't trade that for anything. Eighth and finally, in Christ, it is your duty to be anxious for nothing, casting all your anxieties on him. This is a duty of the Christian life. This is what God reveals clearly in his word, and this is a sweet command from the Lord who knows that we are riddled with stress and constant temptations to be anxious and worry. It is your duty to be anxious for nothing, but cast all of your anxieties on him. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about anything. Mark it down in your minds. Anxiety, worry, is sin. It's disobedience to the Lord. It's a lack of trust in the Lord. And we fight our anxiety and stress by knowing that it is sin. And knowing that the root of that is a lack of trust in the Lord, that He's going to protect you and provide for you and one day perfect you because... He's purified you through the work of Jesus. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Be anxious for nothing. Pray about everything. The Lord is eager to hear from you as his child. If you're in Christ, you're commanded, do not be anxious, but take it all to the Lord. 1 Peter 5, 6-7 Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of the Lord, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. Do you know the Lord Jesus cares for you? He loves you. He commands you not to be anxious, but to go to Him in prayer. He commands you, be anxious for nothing, but cast all of your anxieties. As soon as anxiety comes up, throw it to the Lord. Go to the Lord. Preach the gospel to your own heart. If He has pled His blood for me in His death, He's purified me in saving me. He's protecting me by His providence. He's promised to perfect me in his presence, I'm okay. Whatever the world throws my way, whatever my own sinful flesh throws my way, I know the Lord cares for me. Therefore, I can cast all my anxieties on him. It is your duty to be anxious for nothing, to preach the gospel to your own heart, to sit under the preaching of the word as often as you possibly can, to be reminded of the gospel, so that you would cast all your anxieties on him. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? That's the greatest antidote to your anxiety, so that you would do your duty as a Christian, cast all your anxieties on him. Be anxious for nothing. It's looking to the cross. God did not spare his own son for you, Christian. How will he not also with him 
graciously give us all things, everything we need to glorify Him and enjoy Him forever. As John Newton says in one of his old hymns, Therefore, everything is necessary that He sends, and nothing can be necessary that He withholds. Everything is necessary that the Lord sends your way, and nothing is necessary that He withholds. If He did not spare His own Son for you, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? This is Romans 8, 32. Therefore, in the words of Wilhelmus A. Brockel, a 17th century Dutch Puritan theologian, he says, To withhold Scripture from anyone is an act of ecclesiastical robbery and as well as spiritual murder. All of these duties that are laid out in the Scripture Everything that God lays out in His Word, we need to know it. We need to know that the Scripture principally teaches what we are to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of us. Therefore, to withhold the Scripture from anyone is robbery and spiritual murder. So friends, in application, I would say to you, in closing, knowing what God reveals to us in His Word, are you withholding the truth of the Scriptures from those you know need to be saved? That's robbery and spiritual murder. Are you withholding the Scripture from your group of Christians that you live life with when you're supposed to let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly so that you may be able to teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and insight? Are you withholding the Scripture? Don't rob your friends. Don't spiritually murder those you know need to hear the Word of God. And finally, don't rob yourself by inattention to study deeply what God reveals in His Word. Don't spiritually murder your own soul by withholding the Scriptures from yourself. Read it, be mastered by it, and proclaim it to others. The Scriptures principally teach what we're to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of us. Pray with me. Father, we thank You for Your help, and we trust that your word will not return to you void, but it will accomplish that which you send it forth to accomplish. You will make sinners alive in Christ. So we ask you to do that, and we trust that you will. We ask you to sanctify us and make us more like Jesus, and we trust that you will, that you have done it even in this time as we've looked at your word. Write your word on our hearts. Help us to hide your word in our hearts that we may not sin against you. Help us to glorify you in all things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.